Canto 3 of The Paradise continues in this moon state of mind, this moon sphere of the heavens, this moon aspect of reality, which is one of reflections and transitions and completion rather than perfection. So completion as in accepting the light and the dark these aspects of reality which the physical moon shows in its movement across the heavens. So in this canto, Dante is going to see reflections and get them confused with reality. He's going to look at how things become visible and then invisible once again, um, like they do appear in the silvery light of the moon. Um, he's going to see truth as he accepts arguments, and so understand arguments as reflections of the deeper truth which he can know directly. He's going to see how the physical gives way to what you might call the mental or the soulful, and the soulful will show itself as the, the true reality. He's going to see how life's will waxes and wanes, how people's lives wax and wane and how that can be brought together in the perfection of heaven. And he's going to get distracted by wonders. Um, he's going to have his mind move, not by wanting to step away from reality, but as it's drawn more and more into reality, this transitional state of mind that is in the moon as well. So in, in several different ways, he's going to have an experience of the moon state, um, as you might expect, since he's in the sphere of the moon. The canto begins with another um, hint as to how to understand these different spheres, these different planetary spheres, because it begins with him calling Beatrice the sun. Um, he says that she was the sun of his young life. And that's a real clue because what he's saying is that he understands the physical sun now by its what you might call phenomenological sympathy with the warmth of Beatrice's love that struck him um, like the rays of the sun in his early life and it gives us a hint as to how in this mortal life we can look at the planetary spheres at the sun at the stars and imaginatively step into the spiritual reality that they're reflecting. And we know that because we use um, the sun and the moon metaphorically. Um, you know, you might say that her smile uh, lit up my life like the bright sun. Um, that's a metaphor for her smile, but it's also actually a step into a truer reality, um, which is when your life is lit up by love, by light. Um, and so you can see that when you feel the sun's warmth as well. I think this is what Blake was onto when he said that he doesn't just see the guinea sun rising in the morning like a golden disc, like a coin in the sky. But he sees the heavenly hosts crying, holy, holy, holy. He learns to experience the sun's rise as a step towards the fullness of heavenly reality rather than just as a rather beautiful physical experience, though it certainly is that. And it's precisely because it is that, that it can suggest and remind us with our mind's eye, with our spiritual sight of so much more. He experiences her as a spiritual son in that moment because he says he understood what he calls her proofs and arguments, which we discussed in the previous canto. And the point here, I think, is that he's saying that he realised that reason, um, that being shown something by demonstration, as Beatrice had done, um, isn't the end point, but is actually the pointer, is the sign to the direct appreciation, the direct awareness or knowledge of which the proof or argument is just an indicator. And so he's now able to look, as it were, from her arguments into her eyes, which um, at this point in the paradise very much reflect the direct light, the direct experience of the divine. 
And so this is something about how reason is in proper relation to knowledge now for Dante. Reason isn't the end point, as can often seem to be the case um, in the modern world, but actually it's just a nudge or a, um, a pointer towards full um, knowledge. Um, so reason isn't an end in itself, it's a means to another end. And um, with his recognition of this, as he turns towards her eyes, as he um, experiences more of a glimpse of direct awareness, he's immediately distracted or drawn, I think is better, um, towards something more immediate um, that is beginning to show itself. Um, this is very much the path of the descent through paradise being worked out in these little details by Dante the poet. Um, when you've understood something, when you've seen something, something more will show itself if you have the eyes to see that as well. And it's the way that he begins to see this new aspect of the sphere of the moon, as much as what he actually sees that is important um, for the spiritual transformation. Because he says that he sees it at first as if it was a reflection. And in fact, he turns around and because he presumes that what he's beginning to see is a reflection of the reality that must be therefore behind him. Um, it's, uh, um, remember that he's got in mind what Beatrice was just telling him about the mirrors in front of him. So he's got kind of reflections on his mind. Um, but Beatrice uses this as a lesson to say, no, no, um, what you're learning now is that sometimes when we see things and presume they're reflections, they're actually the substance itself. That's part of learning in the sphere of the moon. And so he says that what was barely distinguishable, what was subtle, um, what he might have dismissed as a mere reflection, he now realises is something um, not just more important to see in the sphere of the moon, but perhaps is even more the essence of the sphere of the moon itself. Because what starts to show itself, he says, looks like a pearl upon a forehead. Now that's really interesting because as he was entering or realising that he'd entered the sphere of the moon, he said it was like entering a pearl. Um, but now what he's saying is that he's seeing, you might say, the true pearl in this pearly state. Um, so the physical side of the sphere of the moon, you know, which we see directly in the night sky, um, is beginning to itself show that it is just a reflection of the true pearl, um, which it is turning out, um, emerging before him, coming um, out of this subtle, barely indistinguishable state. Um, it's showing itself as a soul. And so this soul is itself, you might say, the true pearl. Again, I think this is uh, Dante countering the spiritual materialism, which would collapse um, the physical world onto um, the spiritual world. And he's beginning to show us that actually the physical world, well, the Christian world would be, um, is sacramental um, of the spiritual world. Um, it carries the spiritual to us. And having got that right, he's now able to see the spiritual reality of the sphere of the moon directly. Beatrice says to him, yes, that's right. Don't stare at the emptiness, as it were. Don't just stare at the reason or the reflection but realise that they're pointing towards uh, a truer aspect of reality. And it turns out to be the souls that inhabit this domain. And the soul that he sees um, reveals itself to him as Picarda. He'd known her on Earth. Um, she's the sister of his great friend Donati, who he'd met um, in the purgatory. Um, she's also the sister of a warlord, um, and we'll find out the significance of that when she comes to tell her story. But the first thing um, that Dante, both poet and pilgrim, stresses is that she, she seemed to be sharing in this first moment of her becoming visible, in the first fire of the divine love. Um, she's said to share in the rays of endless life, um, to be full of the sweetness um, which is the direct awareness of the divine. Um, she's living God's will and love fully here. 
But that, that, that then raises a question for Dante, because of course he's seeing her in the sphere of the moon, as he puts it, in the slowest sphere, the one closest to earthly life. Um, and so slow because it's less shaped by God's dynamism, um, which is uh, the fastest moving, the fullness of divine life. And so he wonders quite naturally how it can be that in the one hand she seems so full of divine beauty and yet at the same time is in this lower sphere. And so he asks her outright, how come you can be sharing the fullness of God's bliss and yet also know that you're down here when there's so much more up there that you might also know? It's a very natural and an immensely important question. She explains this to Dante, and it's worth reading these tercets um, because it's by grappling with what she's trying to communicate to Dante that the truth of her words, as it were, light up inside yourself, and so you too gain something from being in the sphere of the moon. But broadly speaking, I think what she's saying is that now she has learnt to accept what you might call the waxing and waning of her life. She explains what happens in her life. Um, she had become a poor Clare nun, um, but because her warlord brother needed to use her in order to secure um, a deal in one of his um, machinations, um, he had removed her from the poor Clare nunnery and uh, married her off to someone whom he wanted to make an alliance with. So she had broken her vows against her own will, um, but nonetheless she says it's because my vows were broken in life that I'm here now in the sphere of the moon. Now this seems like a massive injustice, um, completely unfair. She was forced against her will to break her vow. And I think that we're supposed to feel the fullness of that seeming injustice, that seeming unfairness. You know, how could God have put her into the sphere of the moon? And moreover, how can she say that she is happy to be here, um, that she's feeling the fullness of the divine bliss? Um, surely something doesn't add up about that. Um, we're supposed to feel that edginess, because that is precisely the edginess which can become uh, a moment of sort of awakening, a, wo a moment of appreciating more deeply quite what Picarda is saying. And what she says is that the reason why she's both here in the sphere of the moon, but is experiencing the fullness of divine delight as well, divine life as well, is because she has freely and consciously accepted what happened in her life. She's, you might say, accepting her suffering. And in that suffering, she's accepting the fullness of her human life. And because she's accepting the fullness of her human life, therefore, with its light, but also with its, its true darkness, she is able to be open to the source of her mortal life, which is, of course, the immortal life of God. She's now fully in God because she can say yes to the details of her life. And in that very act of saying yes, she transcends the details of her life to accept um, and be capable of the fullness of the divine life, which always was already the source and wellspring of her life. Now, it's really important that she consciously and freely accepts this. You know, only she can do this. Um, this is not something that can be forced upon her. Um, those who feel this is forced upon them actually um, can't fully appreciate the divine life, strangely enough, if it felt like she was fated to be pulled out of the nunnery. I think she would have been found in purgatory um, having to work through something in order to become more capable of heavenly life. You know, you see this um, every so often in therapy, um, when someone comes having had real suffering in their life, 
um, but through a process of accepting the rage that that brings, the lament that that brings, the sadness that brings, um, the sense of grief, uh, mourning what seemed not to be possible in life because of it, people are able to move to a place where, as it were, they, they rise above what happens to them. They kind of see it in the round. Um, they see it for its completion, not for its perfection. And that actually enables them to become, well, in the first instance, reconciled to what happened. But then you also see them growing. Um, you know, life fills out within them and they become more than themselves. Um, and, you know, with um, the blessing that that can bring, um, their life afterwards can actually become the fullness of life. Um, it's not such a mystery. Um, I was recently watching Michelle Obama's film, Becoming, um, and in that film, um, she spends quite a lot of her time now, it seems, going around speaking to groups, particularly of young black people who have definitely suffered in life, who have definitely um, had lives limited by prejudice and racism and so on. But it's very striking that what she says to them is that very limitation, that oppression which you felt, is actually the energy and resource for your life. And you can convert it, she tells them, into the desire to act more fully in your life, you know, as opposed to just feeling oppressed by it. Um, now, she can say that because she's um, a great exemplar of that. Um, and you have to be very cautious when you say this to people because it can so easily become accept your suffering um, in you know a kind of judgmental way. Um, but it's not meant like that at all. It's meant a bit like taking an in-breath, breathe in your life because then you can breathe out the fullness of life as well. Um, and you know Michelle Obama can get that nuance right and so communicate it to the people um, that she's trying to show this way. I think not dissimilarly to what Picarda is showing Dante here in Canto 3. So I think we're supposed to feel the fullness of this tension, um, the seeming unfairness, but the confession of Picarda that no, she knows divine life fully, even though she finds herself in the sphere of the moon, at least as she's showing herself now for Dante's benefit. And the reason why it's important to feel that tension is because it enables us to get a sense of what it is to rise above the details of mortal life, to see our lives, well as the Latin expression is, sub specie eternitatis, from the viewpoint of eternity. And that viewpoint enables us to experience and appreciate the fullness of life in its completion, in fact, not just our own life, but our own life then becomes a vehicle or a channel um, through which, a portal through which we can experience the fullness of divine life. There's a famous quote um, in this canto which captures something of this as well. Um, it's the quote, and his will is our peace and his will is our peace. Now, just in parenthesis, sometimes it's translated um, and in his will is our peace, um, but um, I'm going with the, the more straightforward translation that says, and his will is our peace. And it's one of those quotes um, which can be said with different levels of understanding. And again, those different levels um, help us to experience the transitional phases of the moon um, that we can go through from the new emptiness of um, the new moon to the fullness, the brightness of the full moon. Um, so you can take, um, and in his will is our peace, and his will is our peace, in a literal sense, um, which means sort of fated. Um, you don't actually have any will yourself, you just have to kind of blindly accept God's will and if you blindly accept, if you accept your fate, then you'll find some peace. Um, that's the literal sense, and I don't think it's the fullest sense that Picarda is trying to communicate to Dante as war, as, uh, at all. Um, the second level will be the allegorical sense of that phrase. So that would be something like, you know, morally, you need to be obedient to God's will. And if you um, 
subject your will to God's will, then you find peace. Now, maybe there's some truth in that, but again, I don't think it's the fullness of heavenly life because God doesn't want um, spiritual robots that just do what he says in abnejection. Um, so then there's the third level, the tropological level, and this is the level of transition, the level of change, and that's where we're wrestling with how can, say, Picard's life with its unfairness be a divine blessing? Um, how can our own suffering, the suffering which we see all around us, the injustices which are so self-evident, how can that possibly ever lead to divine experience? So that's the tropological level where we wrestle with how can it possibly be true that and in his will is our peace and as if it's imposed or inflicted upon us. But with that wrestling comes the fourth level, the anagogic state. And that's the realisation that we can align our will, our desire, our love with the design, divine desire, life and love. Um, we can kind of get our lives from this much bigger perspective. Um, you know, maybe it's easier to do this with others. Um, someone who you know who suffered much and you share the rage, you share the sorrow um, in sympathy, but in a way you already represent for them a stance where they might get their life, where they might accept it and find peace. Um, and moreover, then that peace can become being able to look out from their own life to see the fullness of life around them. Well, the anagogic level is to be able to say, and his will is our peace from our higher selves, um, which is, of course, the divine self within us. And it's the incarnation being born in us in that moment. So that's why in that moment we're sharing the fullness of life. Um, we've been transported, as it were, through the Muni sphere. Now, Picard tells Dante about another soul, much more briefly, um, that's beside her as well, that is similarly shimmering in the silvery light. Um, she was the Empress Constance, and um, it's thought that she was a nun, um, but again, because of political machinations, she had to leave her vows and take up her role as an Empress. Um, so she shares a sort of parallel story to Picard. I think she's given to Dante in this heavenly moon because it gives him another chance to really take in what Picarda has been saying with another example, with another proof, if you like. Um, and this is really an important dynamic here. You know, Beatrice underlines it when she says, think carefully what love is. We are supposed to drive into love with our questioning, with our not understanding, with our own moony states of mind, in order to be able to see and appreciate it more fully. Um, that dynamic is hinted at several times throughout the canto. So for example, when Picarda first appears, Dante doesn't actually recognise her. She is too beautiful and um, he doesn't see her earthly features. But when she speaks, he sees that it's her. And it's her words, as it were, that illuminate the vision. And broadly speaking, I think this is the difference between a real visionary state achieved as opposed to just being gobsmacked by the mystery, um, which is how Dante was when he first entered the sphere of the moon. And you might say that vision, as opposed to mystery, is wonder, but added to that is clearer sight and deeper understanding. So when to our wonder we bring in sight and understanding, we get a fuller vision and so able to rise and not just as it were get hit by one mystery after another. It's very striking that towards the end of the canto Picard disappears. Um, Dante says she disappears like someone disappearing into the depths of water. Again we've got reflections water um, keeping us in this moony state. Um, I think she disappears because in a way she's returning to the fullness of divine life in the Imperium. She's come down into this particular sphere of reality, this particular dimension of existence, to exemplify that for Dante's benefit. So Dante can learn. This is the generosity of spirits in paradise. They will give much as the divine life just gives 
in order to draw all back to itself in the freest and most conscious state that's possible. And now that she's imparted her wisdom, she disappears, I think, because she returns to the fullness of divine life, to the first fire of love, because that's what her life, with its light and its darkness, has meant she's now capable of. And Dante, in the last lines of the canto, turns back to Beatrice as he might. And actually, he's dazzled by her in this moment. He can't look at her. Um, he is in a state of transition himself. Um, and so the dazzle returns, um, this cycle of understanding, being able to see, but then that in itself uh, leading you to be first dazzled by more, more tropological states of mind that open up more of reality. And in fact, in the next canto, Dante is going to have more questions about this heavenly moon as he seeks to understand it further and further.